This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kevin Savitz. Maurice Molyneux was a game artist, Atari graphics animator, and writer. He wrote articles for Video Games and Computer Entertainment Magazine and Analog Computing Magazine, and wrote the Animation Stand column for STLog Magazine. He created many animations for various clients, primarily using Movie Maker, an animation program for the Atari, which was published by Reston Publishing. Those clients included Broderbund, Epix, Antic Magazine, Omnitrend, and others. This interview took place on November 20th, 2017. Uh, I'm Maurice Molyneux. I'm a one-time columnist for Analog and ST-Log magazines. Uh, I'm running buddies with a lot of the old Analog crew, notably Diane Gaw, who you mentioned, Tom Hudson, John Bell, Clay Walnum, and <clears throat> some of the other reprobates. Uh, I'm a one-time computer game artist, uh, game designer and producer, uh, but largely retired from the biz aside from the occasional contract gig, like I'm doing one for uh, my former employer right now, doing some writing for them. These days, I'm mostly focused on writing and filmmaking uh, with occasional dabbling in graphics and so forth. Uh, so to prepare for this interview, I tried to reconstruct how I happened to get involved in computers and computer graphics and animation. And in looking through my old photos and graphics and magazine articles, I realized how much I'd sort of filed away in the back of my brain. Um, so if you're willing to indulge me, I'll try to explain how I got from here to there to here. Um, Please. In briefly. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, jumping back, uh, I, uh, when I was in high school in the late 70s into early 80s, there were no computers in the schools I went to. Uh, my brother got access to one right after I graduated. He had a TRS-80 he could work with in a computer lab in, in school. Uh, <clears throat> so um, basically, uh, I actually got into computers because I wanted to be a writer and filmmaker, uh, my first inkling of an interest in filmmaking was uh, by way of the book The Making of Star Trek, uh, oddly enough, which I read somewhere around maybe 75 or 76. And I was probably the only kid in my junior high who understood how uh, TV shows were made. And then along comes spring of 77. I saw a Starlog magazine with Star Wars on the front cover. Uh, and the film looked so visually amazing. I just wanted to make a movie just on the basis of the stills. I hadn't even seen the film. Uh, so, you know, of course, back in those days, movies didn't open everywhere. So, um, you know, wide releases were just starting and podunk t- towns, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, podunk towns like the one I lived in, uh, you wouldn't get a big movie for months after its release. Anyway, so I finally saw it uh, and it was like cemented in my mind that filmmaking and stuff was what I really wanted to do. Now, um, when I got into high school, uh, I quickly got tur- hooked up with a guy named Robert Cantrell and uh, he had an eight millimeter uh, camera. And uh, so um, he and this, um, and I got together and I helped him making a bunch of really crappy little scenes and largely unfinished shorts, you know, the kind of stuff where you dip the tip of a pin in alcohol and scratch the emulsion of film frames to make laser effects and things like that. Um, I've actually digitized it. I, I scanned film at the Internet Archive and we'll talk about that later. And uh, I can send you clips of some of this stuff awesome that sounds Uh-oh. terrible i can't wait to see it <laughs> <laughs> yeah anyway um so um you know we were doing stop motion animation like with clay figures and uh um little you know we had like articulate uh, model dinosaurs we'd animate and uh you use anything you can hot wheels running around and make you know traffic scenes and so forth um but the thing was, it was really, it was very time consuming doing that kind of animation. I always liked it. It was kind of funny because you just sort of that meticulousness. It never was boring to me, even though it takes forever to do it. Um, so, yeah, so I wanted to be a filmmaker, uh, but my friend Robert and I were just not on the same page. Uh, he was uh, an interesting character. Um, and uh, sadly, he passed away not long after high school. He actually was a... Uh, makeup artist in Hollywood and he worked on Fright Night. That was one of the last films he worked on. Um, And he's like in the documentary about that. So, uh, but anyway, I'm getting a little jumping ahead here, but uh, so we made these films, but uh, just the cost and complexity of doing something on a, on film is something I don't think people who didn't grow up in the film era understand, you know, that if you want to do anything, you have to shoot it, but you can't see it until you develop it. 
And then, of course, if you make a mistake, there's nothing much you can do unless you, you know, you can't take Super 8 to a special laboratory and do color correction or anything like that. So, you know, uh, it was a very tedious and, and complicated process. It was very expensive. You know, everything costs money. You know, And I thought about doing animation, but even that you had to buy all the uh, acetate and the paints and everything. And it just was this huge, huge uh, expense. So... Uh, you know, it was just not a practical thing. So, uh, you know, um, still before reality slapped me in the face, I ended up storyboarding idea my friend Vince had for an animation to accompany the Rush song Cygnus X1, if you know that one. Um, I, I simply junked most of the storyboard, but I still have a few fragments of it. Uh, it would have been next to impossible to do it in 1983, but today it would be relatively simple. Um Anyway, so around that time, um, I, I forget if my brother got it first or my sister, but they both got Atari computers. Uh, my brother got an Atari 600 XL, and uh, he um, started playing around with that, you know. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> one of the things he did on it that was, I thought was hilarious, well, uh, was he wrote a multiple choice text adventure game called Rusty Armor, the Saga of Robin the Not So Pure, based on the uh, Sir Robin character uh, of. Uh, uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> you had all this sort of Monty Python humor in this thing, and you'd be confronted with something like the Black Beast of Arg, and your choices might be fight, run away, or soil your armor, and things of that nature. You know, And <laughs> funnily enough, it, it's probably lost to the ages because it was saved on a cassette drive, and I'm sure it's long, long gone. Um, but anyway... So he had that. Um, he gave me, well, I bought his Atari 5200 off of him uh, when he got the computer. And that really got me kind of interested in the, uh, the games. I was already interested in video games by that point. But uh, Star Raiders was the thing that really grabbed me. I'd seen it on computers in computer stores. But then actually able to play it at home was the thing that got me really interested. And I did sort of sure. like sketchy game design as I thought about how to do a sequel to Star Raiders. Um, nothing like the Star Raiders 2 that was recently uncovered. Uh, it was a little more pure to the original. Uh, <clears throat> actually, but I, I had the idea of taking, like, when the, uh, they had the star bases, there'd be enemy star bases, and they'd have, like, a, a thermal exhaust port that would rotate around. Oh, you know, yeah. would have to punch a, a weapon into it. <laughs> a little special targeting. I was trying to figure out how to reuse what was already there, you yeah. know, in those days. Cool. Anyway, so all these kind of influences were coming in there. There was like film and animation and uh, computer, you know, video game graphics. And then the computer came along. And uh, so uh, one of the things that my brother was doing is he'd just start you know, doing basic programming. And he'd uh, you know, write, do those things where you write like, programs and use data statements and you draw like moray patterns on the screen in graphics eight, you know. Uh, and uh, what is that, antic mode F? I'm trying to remember. I think so. Okay, yeah. It's funny how that stuff is still in your brain somewhere. <laughs> Modaf, yes. Anyway, so that got me interested in, in trying to see how to do it. But, of course, I knew nothing about computers. Um, so, anyway, so my brother um, wrote a ba really simple basic program with, uh, you know, pl uh, plot and draw two statements. And all I had to do was write in the data. You know, he, just, he put the form in there. So I cut to graph paper and I laid out a map of a planet and I spent all that time typing it in and uh, then having to debug it, you know, get the line that goes off the wrong direction because you got a number wrong. <clears throat> but there was something, and I think this is the thing that was funny, was that um, seeing your own handiwork on a screen back in that time, especially a TV screen, was it's not a, it wasn't an everyday occurrence like now. I mean, like, like my phone and everything. So, you know, you, you really felt you accomplished something, even if it was just drawing some crude, you know, um, Graphic, especially because you had to get, jump through all those hoops of abstraction. You know? Sure, yeah, yeah. The draw on graph paper, I have to turn it into numbers, I have to put it into the program, and then run the program and, and, and debug it. Uh, so, you know, that, that was really got my attention because, oh, look, I can do this. And then um, my first experience with computer animation came not long after that. And, you know, it's been, oh, my God, what, 40 years? <laughs> Something like that. So it's a little hard to remember all the specifics, almost 40 years. Anyway, um, I had a friend named Gary Click, and he owned a computer store that I hung out at. And he wrote a custom utility on his Apple II. I forget what he called it, 
Uh, but it was a utility would read the you know screens of graphics and compare each frame to the subsequent one, storing only the changes, which is of course is you know what they call uh, delta compression, and it was used in stuff like Cyber Studio and things like that later on. But Gary had this all going on his Apple II years years before, and uh, unfortunately, while he had the machine language parts all working, he could never seem to sit down and finish writing a user interface portion. So it was like this complicated command line parsing thing. Yeah. So. I kept pressing him to like take it to uh, Sierra and have you know sell them the component and have them write the front end, but he, he would never do it. So you know, there you go, missed opportunity. Um, anyway, so uh, he had a koala pad and he said, "Oh, you want to try to animate something?" And I drawn this little cartoon mouse back in high school in a comic strip I drew. So I did a series of frames of the mouse rubbing his hands together evilly, you know, and. Uh, so it was a fairly simple drawing, and I changed that, and I put that into the program, and voila, there was the very first piece of computer animation I did. And so that was a really big step up from a still picture to something that actually moves that you could draw with your hand, you know, on the tablet, uh, as crude as that was. So um, that really was what really got me wanting to be, you know, involved in this stuff. So... Um, Right around that time, I got my first real job uh, yeah, doing data entry, oddly enough, for a mining company <laughs> that had a field office where I lived. And uh, it was supposed to be a two-week job. I ended up working there for like three years because um, they liked me so much. Where I actually learned to write D-based programming. Yeah, there's a useless <laughs> skill. <laughs> anyway, um, so I, I had uh, money, and then right around that time, the Tremels had bought Atari, and I dropped out. Oh, no, it was just before the Tremels bought Atari? Uh, no, it was right after because it was the end of 84 and all the prices had dropped down to like rock bottom. So I got an 800 XL and disk drives and all that. And, and of course, the first thing I had to do is go buy an Atari touch tablet and graphics software. And uh, I also got the, uh, the there was a light pen. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to remember who made it. It wasn't Atari's light pen. It mm -hmm. was like. There were there were a couple of third party. Maybe. Text sketch. Text sketch. It came with something called Micro Illustrator. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so um, you know, I got the, uh, the the pads and I started fiddling around with that stuff and uh, you know, um, and so I spent a lot of time just drawing graphics. And, and one of the things I've been really good about is I kept most of my work because I backed up every format I've had to some other format. So I have graphics going. I think I had the very first computer graphic I did. I reproduced it in uh, uh, on my Atari. Uh, later on <clears throat> from the graph paper. So I have that image somewhere around here on my uh, on my Mac, on my Mac. Cool. <clears throat> anyway, so um you got all this uh this stuff. So, you know, um I really wanted to do something more with it, but you know, because stills are interesting, but you know, let's face it, you're doing four colors on, you know, antic mode E, which is what, one sixty by no well, one ninety two, and then there's no, that was a D. Anyway. Uh, so, you know, it, 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 there's very limited what you can do with that. But um, the uh, the thing that I thought was interesting was, you know, when you have four colors, this goes back to what we talked about before we before we were talking about uh, low resolution graphics was because, you know, when your typical graphics mode only had four colors at once, you have to really quickly learn how to make such severe limitations work for you. So by the time like the ST rolled around with four times as many colors on the screen, I was like in heaven. Uh, and the funny thing is, like I said, 16 years later, when mobile phones first started being used to play games, they mostly had severe resolution and color you know, limitations. So I was like ideally suited to train artists on raised on Photoshop how to work in clunky pixels. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so a silly quick example of that was uh, I had an artist. We were doing a Peanuts game for uh, now it's Bandai Namco, but it was Namco Networks. And... Uh, we had to draw the characters really small for these cell phones. And I remember that we were having trouble. He was having trouble getting Lucy to look right. And it turned out because at the resolution, the, the characters were Lucy and Linus had the smallest noses of the characters. And uh, at that resolution, their noses should be one and a half pixels tall. <laughs> and he couldn't make it happen. So finally, at some point I said, you know what? Go fix those other things. Give me the sheet. And I went and I took the five flesh tones we had and i just dithered every possible combination until i found the the effect that anti-alias did where it basically looked like it was one and a half pixels by putting just the right two shades of 
of color next to each other. Sure. And that's, that's like a, such a lost skill that you had <laughs> annually back in the day, you know. And uh, cause I just, even when you try automatic tools for doing that now, they often don't do it right. You know, they, they it makes it mushy. So anyway, yeah, so that was, uh, you know, you, you had to look to work in that kind of stuff. So anyway, um, what happened then was, of course, I don't remember exactly when it was, but it was probably in 1985, I, I got the original Reston release of Movie Maker. Yeah. Um, and started playing around with that. And I even have it over there. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, fussing around with that. So you know, it didn't take me long to start using multiple tools to streamline the process to get any kind of good results out of it. Because uh, Movie Maker had a drawing function uh, in its quote unquote compose uh, mode, but it was something really primitive and joystick driven. So you're trying to draw with a joystick, and you know, and, and that was just really clumsy. Um, so uh, I asked around my local Atari users group, and I got some utilities that would let me convert graphics from one format to another. So I could use whatever tool would be the best one. So I could use the Atari Touch Tablet for some things, but like there were certain uh, functions that were in the Micro Illustrator program that I use a light pen for. So I might start in one, take it to the other, do another thing, and then convert it over to uh, the Movie Maker format. But the Movie Maker format was in, um, let me think, what was the mode? Uh, uh, okay, we we're talking about Antic Mode E. Mm-hmm. Um, that was one graphic. of us is just gonna have to bring up the chart of modes. Yeah, Come yeah. On. I think it was graphics seven and a half, <laughs> whatever they typed in basic. But anyway, so uh, yeah, Movie Maker wrote in mode D, which was the lower resolution version of that. So it was 160 by 92 pixels. So pretty kind of crude. So all the graphics in those programs were all 160 by 196. So they were all double the vertical resolution. So when I convert them, invariably there'd be pixels missing and stuff. So you'd have to go touch them up and everything. Though I got pretty good at that stuff. So uh, anyway, so I had to use all that stuff and I got pretty good at, at putting that kind of stuff together. And uh, so I started playing around with the software. And I, I don't know if you're familiar with the software, if you've seen many of the demos. I've, I've seen your movie maker demos that you put on YouTube. Okay, which yeah. were a lot of fun. I've no, I don't think I've ever used the software itself. Uh, yeah, it's really, to modern standards, really unfriendly. You know, it's one of those, because 48K of memory, you had to load and unload modules. So, oh, I want to change this. Now I have to go unload that, save my work, go back into the other thing. You know, you couldn't just step step uh, crosswise. Yeah. But uh, I did make a bunch of links, which I'll email you later, of other movie maker animations that were, like, put out by other people so people can see you know, what the sort of the state of the art was with yeah, that. The end result was pretty cool. I was expecting a lot less than I saw in, in, your, in your videos. I mean, there was some neat stuff going on with the, the bouncing yeah. analog thing. and the, <laughs> um, Everybody wanted to do the bouncing ball back in those yeah, days. Yeah. So, you know, I thought, well, I'm going to bounce the analog A around. Yeah, that was nice. um, so, you know, the, uh, the, um, the thing that was funny was, so I, you know, I pretty quickly learned to sort of pushing the envelope because that's me, uh, was that I, you know, you how to create an illusion that was there was, there was more capable than the software actually was. So like since Mo D only gave me four colors, okay, so I'll design it so I can flip the um, a color or two at the right instances to make it seem like there are more colors. Uh, so uh, and then the software can only move like six six sprites. They call them actors. And I figured out how to arrange the source art in such a way that I could set the bounding boxes different for different frames, so I could like combine two objects into one bounding box. So I could actually have more than six actors effectively. Huh. I mean, there's actually six software sprites, but you could sort of trick the software by, you know, how you lay the stuff out to create all these, um, these kind of illusions that there's more going on. Um, so like, yeah, and since I could, you could, since it was an Atari and not like a Commodore 64, you could alter the luminance, you know, values and stuff like that. And you could do it frame by frame. So I figured out, that uh, I could do things like rotate an object, and instead of just turning it, I would change the color palette as it rotated, so it created the sense there was some dimension to it, even if it was a flat rotation, you know, sort of like the Fuji Boink demo, you know, that kind of thing. So you yeah. sort of figure out all these limitations, and you figure out sort of ways around them, you know, say, so, okay, how, how can I make this, you know, work? Um, and uh, so, you know, um, the software was really clunky, uh, and uh, like I said, being different utilities under one shell, it was really something I had to struggle with a lot. Um, and if you look at most of the Movie Maker animations that are out there, they're really kind of clunky. 
in part due to the limitations of the software. Uh, but even the good ones, and some better, some have better drawn animation than mine, often feel a little off because there are things that feel clumsy, uh, which is why editing is so important, you know. Uh, and I tend to create animations which ran like about as fast as the software could ever manage, you know, you could set different speeds. But I found that if I ran at the slower rates, they never felt good, you know. So you always try to maximize it. And then yeah, I'd spend a lot of time adjusting things frame by frame till it felt right, you know. Because if you when you see these demos, you'll see some of the people like characters are running and they have a loop, but they're just sort of sliding around. They don't feel like they're grounded in the scene. Yeah. You know, yeah. Things like that. Um, much like 3D game characters do now where they're <laughs> in place. And, the legs are going three times as fast as they should be uh, traveling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, like, uh, timing is a big part of it. And, and you know, film and animation are all about the um, not just movement, but movement in time. And uh, so, you know, you have to try to figure out, like, how to line up the sound effects exactly with the, the action and everything to make it land. And you learn all the tricks, like, that um, you're – and it's a funny thing. I still see it to this day in computer software. Your eyes pick up things faster than your ears do, obviously. Mm -hmm. So if you really go through like a video editing software, you'll often find that the sound of the picture are actually not in sync. They're actually off. Like you'll see like the slate clap on your camera and it's off by like two frames. And when you're doing film editing, you discover that because it takes longer for the sound to register, you often move the sound effects back. So they happen like two frames before so that they sort of meet in your brain at the huh. right instant. It's, wow. it's a funny, it's a funny thing. So often you'll put, you'll put it right on the frame. It looks right. And it's not right. Right. And I figured huh. that stuff out back on the Atari. So that was, you know, pretty um, fun. Just that, that, you know, uh, mode of discovery there uh, to figure that kind of stuff out. Um, and uh, so like you, if you saw the animations I, I did, uh, I would do like the, there was a one, I had a little cartoon character. It was like a, he was like a parody of Batman. Yes, yeah. and his, his very facial express, expression yeah, and well, his I eyes are doing different things. I was trying to play around with, can you make so it feels like it's having a conversation or somebody talking, even though I'm just using these musical tones to represent, like, his voice, because there's obviously no voice on the thing. So that was a, another experiment to see, like, how can you sort of plus something that's really still, you know, and, and really crude and try to put some emotion into it. Um, and... Uh, so that, that kind of stuff was really, really, you know, fun, just trying to, try to figure out how far you could push that. Um, the one disappointment I did have with Movie Maker is it really didn't exploit everything the Atari hardware was capable of. Uh, you know, basically it created software sprites using the graphics data you drew up, but it totally ignored the player missile graphics system, um, which could have been used to put some extra color or objects on the screen. It wouldn't have been that difficult. But I suspect they wrote the software a little more generic so they could port it to other systems. Yeah. You know, because I know they did take it to the Commodore 64. Weirdly enough, I tried to Google animations for the other versions, and I can't find almost any. It's like that software, if anybody used it, it's like nobody's ever recorded it. There's a fair amount of the Movie Maker stuff for the Atari out there, but not for the uh, Commodore and stuff like that. Although I did run into some some years ago, but I wasn't able to find it again. Um, so anyway, you couldn't use that. So that, you know, that you really didn't use the Atari's strengths as well as possible. Um, so here's a funny thing. I got an ST practically the day it hit the stores. I remember my, my 520 ST with a color monitor uh, and one single-sided drive sent me back exactly $937.50. Um, and I think that was before tax. Anyway, um, so I had the super powerful computer, you know, comparatively. Uh, but it was basically a doorstop for a long time because there was no significant software for it. Uh, and certainly nothing resembling animation software. So I had to keep working on animations in Movie Maker because that was the only tool that I had. So a lot of the ones you saw were actually in the ST era because there was just nothing you know, available to do that. Um, and I don't want to get into the ST too much because this is an antic podcast. Um, but uh, you know, I was able to get uh, eventually get good paint tools for it and good animation software, and that pretty much was the end of my 8-bit days. Uh, but here's a little irony for you: uh, using it, uh, um, and even uh, though I created two accessory discs for the um, Antic Cyber Studio package, uh, I actually didn't have that much affection for the ST in the long run, even though I was a columnist for ST Log and everything. Uh, there's something really hands-on about the old Atari 8-bits. Uh, that I really like. I, you feel sort of closer to the hardware. 
Um, and my relationship feels at home more tangible. It's like it's realer, you know. Um, yeah. Years ago, I ripped all my 800 nesty floppy disks so I could get all the data on a PC or Mac and run them under emulation. So I don't need the actual hardware. But while my ST remains down in the garage, it hasn't been plugged in in a decade. My 130XE is in my office, plugged into a beautiful little Sony Trinitron professional monitor and still gets played with. So, you know, that tells you something. Um, you know, like I play, I play Castle Crisis on it all the time because I love that because uh, I love Arcade Warlords and that's the closest thing I have at home. Um, let's see. Um, a few other 8-bit things. Uh, although I'm not exactly the... the f- focus of the uh, this podcast i did almost work on a game or two on the 5200 in the 90s uh when the whole retro gaming scene was starting up uh hey you know it has antic chips so i guess it's germane right yes <laughs> it counts uh so uh i was one of the two guys originally with alan davis kicking around the idea and concepts would have what eventually became adventure 2 um And uh, what happened with that was that uh, Alan and I lost touch with each other, and he went and took the game to Cafe Man, and I didn't hear about it until they were well into production about it. And there was a little momentary bruised feelings about that on my part. But uh, then I realized, I said, you know, it was not a big deal. And, you know, I mean, they took a couple of the ideas I had put out there early on, um, but nothing, you know, super major. I remember that I had my original list and I had the Minotaur on there and there'd be an ice castle and a, you know, a lava castle and a few other little things like that. Um, so that was just kind of funny. Uh, and do you know who, uh, Kevin Horton is? No, I don't know that name. Okay. Kevin Horton is a really extraordinary uh, electrical engineer and he reverse engineered the ColecoVision back in the nineties. Uh, and, uh, he wrote the first, homebrew game that I know of on the Coleco, but he did Kevtris, where he did a Tetris game on it. Um, and Kevin was the kind of guy, he actually took, he'll take like an Atari 5200 and figure out how to smash it down to this small, or he'll build, like he built with a, building, a thing he called Bankzilla, where he made a giant bank switch Atari 2600 and jammed it in a 7800 case. Cool. And I had a friend of mine uh, who does uh, brass etching. I designed a logo for it, so that it's a place of the old you know metal Atari Thing. It's got a Godzilla footprint squashed in Atari logo, you know, <laughs> stomped in it, and the sort of burned logo on it. And uh, so Kevin built these kinds of things, and he was toying around uh, with the idea of doing maybe a running and jumping action game uh, for like uh, the 5200. Um, and uh, I was working on this Deep Space Nine game for the Sega Genesis at the time. And so I liked the kind of the mechanism that I'd come up with for the platformer. And so I'd actually drawn up some screens uh, of how that might work. And I even worked out a little animated sprite blazing a player missile graphic and how to make a, a little animated like a Cisco character from Deep Space Nine run. And it actually looked like he was running, which was interesting because you had to sort of figure out like the usual thing. Like if you look at something like Pitfall, the guy's arms go way out here. Yeah, yeah. But when you really learn how to animate, one of the things you learn is it's all about silhouettes. And if you can make something move like it, like the, it was really tight. It was only eight pixels wide. But I figured if I just did the right overlapping you know, action and I laid two players on top of each other and use that interference pattern where you can make the third color, I could make this really a fairly elaborate sprite you know, to re- represent this little running man who actually looked like he was a little running man, running like a real human being um, in incredibly low <laughs> <laughs> pixel density, uh, but that never went anywhere. Um, but anyway, uh, the funny side thing from that is uh, Kevin and I started, he wanted to do a bank switched giant game for the ColecoVision. He designed it. He was going to design a custom circuit board for it. So it couldn't be pirated, you know, that you'd have to have the circuit board to run it. So it was like basically sort of like minor 2049 or uh, not minor 24, but Bounty Bob strikes back. It's really hard to pirate it because of the way the hardware is done. Mm-hmm. He was going to do that on the ColecoVision. And uh, the game was sort of a naughty parody of Donkey Kong, uh, <laughs> uh, which is going to make fun of all these other video games. Um, so you'd be, instead of the, um, instead of the, the, um, the oh, what do you call it, the, 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 the gorilla, 
there's a big muscle bound brute at the top of the screen everywhere trying to seduce your love interest and you have to do all these things to, you know, stop him. So one level is sort of like uh, Donkey Kong. One level is like um, uh, Minor 2049er. Uh, another one was like Kangaroo. <laughs> so it was going to be like this really crazy game. And, and since he had 256K bank switch cartridge in mind, we like threw away 16K on the title screen. <laughs> because every sprite the machine could use. But, you know, the, but... But, you know, we both got busy. I was working at a game company and Kevin was, you know, back in uh, the Midwest. So it just sort of he lost interest. And so we never really, you know, went ahead with it. Um, but the thing that came out of that, interestingly enough, was I got so familiar with the hardware of the 5200 and the uh, ColecoVision because of Kevin that I actually wrote up an article that's still on the old Atari HQ website uh, doing a head to head comparison of the 5200 versus ColecoVision's graphics. And what was interesting there was learning for the first time how difficult it is to objectively say something is better because there's all these little subtle, you know, nuances between it. Like, so the thing that Kevin pointed out to me, for instance, is that like a Z80 microprocessor in a ColecoVision is clocked twice as fast as the, uh, the, the 6502 and the uh, Atari computers in the 5200, but the, uh, it takes two cycles per instruction on the Z80. So even though it's got twice the clock speed, it's effectively running the same number of instructions. So that's the kind of thing so when people start comparing these numbers, unless you actually understand the way the hardware actually works, you don't really have any meaningful comparison from that. It's just like, oh, well, uh, your mine runs at 4.3 megahertz and yours runs at 1.7. Yeah, well, how many instruction cycles does it take you know, to do that? So that's the kind of stuff that uh, I think is really still fascinating. Um, I'm kind of a junkie for learning all that stuff. Um, and uh, it's something that I still see when people compare stats and anything, you know, that they, they try to pull up these numbers. Um, but, you know, I, I've never, I was never a programmer or anything like that. I was always really interested in, um, in the hardware and, uh, um, you know, what you could do with it. And the Atari still fascinates me for that. Like, uh, like early on, I, I wish I, I had it. Um, I never actually got it animated, but I wanted to play around with the uh, um, GTIA modes on the uh, Atari. Mm -hmm. And what I was trying to figure out was something that nowadays you, you see done a little bit, but you know how the GTIA mode is only 80 pixels across and they're those flat wide pixels? Yes. So I was trying to figure out, I said, well, how do you move at sub pixel resolution, right? So what I did is I drew out a, a ship on, on my Atari ST in grayscale at, you know, basically four times the horizontal resolution of the, uh, yeah, of the, because it was 320 pixels opposed to 80. Right. And then what I did is I moved it one pixel and then one pixel and then one pixel and one pixel. And then I'd take each frame and I'd squish it, you know, down to one quarter its width. And then you had the data. And what happened was, of course, the color, would, it, would, it would average it and it would bleed it. And so what I did is when I tested it, you'd see the ship would sort of bleed across the resolution because the color would shift. So I actually was moving a GTIA object at one quarter pixel <laughs> in the illusion thereof. I mean, really, it's the pixels are the same, but it's just because of the, the anti-aliasing in a way. But I used the, the ST to generate the graphics to put into the Atari oh, cool. 800 to do that. And I, that's the thing that really, to this day, fascinates me because the thing that about working with the Atari computer was the limitations were so severe. You know, uh, they didn't seem like it at the time, but you know now, you know, there's so much that's just, you know, there's my supercomputers in your pocket, and uh, but that taught me to appreciate like pushing against envelopes. And that's something I still, you know, like apply to this day. Like um, I've done as a filmmaker, I've done a bunch of these 48 hour film project uh, contests where you literally have two days to write, shoot, edit and deliver a uh, seven minute short subject. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you have to do all the creative work in that time. And uh, and they give you like a, a prop you have to use and a line of dialogue and a character in their occupation. And the funny thing that I got from the Atari was learning that that's fun to actually say, okay, that's not a pain in the ass. It's like, how, how clever can I be pushing against that boundary? You know, that's, that's sort of been the, the big thing that came out of the Atari for me 
from that was learning that less that life lesson that that restrictions aren't necessarily a burden they're sort of a blessing because they they force you to be more creative mm -hmm. they force yeah. you to just be cleverer than, than you would be otherwise so you know um uh that's pretty much, you know, the, the stuff uh, I have about the uh, Atari 800 and all that. I mean, I have the whole longer career with the ST and the video game stuff, but that may or may not be germane to this particular uh, discussion. Um, well, I'm interested to know, uh, I know you wrote for a little bit for Analog and a lot for ST Log. I'm interested in how that came about. And uh, <laughs> Okay. It came about because of graphics, because I kept seeing articles in these magazines and and things i'd see these really lousy graphics you know on like the st and stuff and so i thought i'd want some graphics that i thought were kind of nice so i decided to write up an article which was called pixel perfect and it was sort of like sort of really basic drawing technique stuff you know and here's the funny thing i submitted it first to uh antic and they rejected it but they sent it back and they stupidly left a post-it note on the letter that said, uh, we're sending this back, but hey, look, check out the graphics. They're kind of cool. So it was kind of insulting and, you know, uh -huh. oh, yeah, I see. Okay, good enough. So I sent the Arctic to Analog and they just immediately bought it. And uh, <clears throat> so that was just you know, like the, I mean, I'd always been writing since high school and that's sort of the thing that the, the corollary to this was being, I want to be a filmmaker and it was not practical before I got into the animation stuff, I decided I'd take the stories I wanted to do as a filmmaker and write them. So I started writing scripts in high school. So I had a I had a, a screenplay, which I have around here somewhere, um, which um, I wrote when I was 13. Oh, it's really terrible. I'm going to get a bunch of actors over here one of these days and actually read it. Oh, nice. Yeah. And have real <laughs> actors read it because I think that'll be hilarious to have this, you know, played like straight and dramatically. Um, but anyway, um, the uh, so I'd always been writing and, I, and since I couldn't figure out how to make a film, I actually started writing novels. And I was, actually had a complete draft of a novel by the time I was 17 when I was in high school. And I wrote like six drafts. This is before I had a computer and I had to write it on a, a typewriter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 600 pages. I mean, the, the word processors make it so much easier. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, um, so, you know, I was always, I'd been writing a lot. I wrote for the school paper and I actually worked for a local newspaper for a short time. So I was always writing. So when analog came along and I was getting interested in computers, it just was sort of a natural fit because I said, hey, I can start writing about what I'm interested in and what I know about. So uh, I kind of wanted to write more for about the uh, 800, but they're sort of, they were, they had their stock, their, their stock, you know, um, of guys, you know, for that, you know, uh, you had Clay Walno and all those guys who were already doing that. And since the ST was really, really new, that was sort of where I went and started writing a lot about that. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a, I wrote an article that was basically called uh, Hardwares, and it was basically, no, 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 it was customizing the Gem Desktop. That was it. It was trying to like reverse engineer how it worked by taking apart the file and figuring out how you could modify it and stuff like that. And then. They bought that. I don't remember the exact order, but then I wrote another kind of how-to, and they decided to not publish them in the original order. You know, they they said, okay, we'll do the one about. I wrote about hardware first, where I described like everything, like what what is a what is RAM, what is ROM, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that quickly just became my regular gig for them. But I did three of them, and they really liked them, and uh, so I just kept doing it, and I ended up doing that for two years. I did like twenty-four issues of that um and uh i think it was funny because i had one of the biggest columns in that magazine i had wrote four thousand words a month wow i had like five pages of the magazine that were mine <clears throat> and here's the, here's the funny story about that so when i was talking to lee pappas uh, whom i think i'm sure you know um yeah. he we were on the phone one day and i was saying something and he said he made he said oh we get the reader service cards in uh, your uh, your column is like the most popular thing in the magazine in ST Log, and I said, well, then you won't mind paying me the technical rate then instead of the standard rate, will you? 
because the standard rate was like $65 a page mm-hmm. and the technical rate was $120 a page. Mm-hmm. And he said, ooh, you got me. So I ended up making <laughs> like my rent every month writing that damn column. Nice. Two years. Um, because back in those days, you could afford an apartment for you know $500 a month. Uh, <laughs> so, um, and that was really great because the thing that, that came out of that was I got in, in uh, analog was on the, um, um, the old uh, Delphi network. Not the Delphi that's around now, but the old... I forget who who had it. I don't remember who owned it. Anyway, so that's they had their own you know board there. So I ended up talking to Tom Hudson and you know Charlie Bashand and and all those guys and Clay Walnum all up there. And then of course, I flew out uh, to meet Andy Eddy, and we went to uh, the Worcester the Worcester Atari show in '87. And that's where we all met each other, you know, face to face. And I met uh, Charles Johnson and the whole gang there, and. Uh, and that was just sort of the thing that sort of really dragged me to the computer stuff. And the funny thing is that this is the, the place where the Atari sort of led me in a strange direction because I went to that show and I had been doing an interview with a guy at uh, a software company called Andromeda Software. Uh, they were um, It was a British publisher. And they were publishing a program that eventually came by Epics called uh, Art and Film Director. Okay. It was done originally, the company was Nova Trade International in Budapest, and uh, they had done animation software. They Basically, the tools they used were doing uh, graphics and animation for their own games, you know, and they made a package out of this. And uh, so I, as press, had wanted to do animation, so I got my hands on this stuff by contacting the guy, and he saw me as press, so he wanted me to have this stuff. And uh, so what happened was, as we got talking, we were talking about games because his company did that. His name was, his name is Steve Friedman. Uh, we've been friends forever. And uh, he said, oh, hey, I'm really interested in your ideas for games. He said uh, at one point, he goes, uh, I'm talking to Simon and Schuster about doing a game for them. And they have the Star Trek license, you know. And I thought, okay, sure. So um, I went off and I had already been fooling around on the ST with Tom Hudson's CAD 3D software. Mm-hmm. So I went and built a bunch of little 3D starships, and I then you know ro- rotated them. There was no animation software, but I could render frames of it out, and I cut those out, put them into sheets, and took them into this film director program. And I actually wrote up a game proposal. I actually made a three, two, three minute demo of what the game would look like, and I animated it. And that's actually also up on YouTube. It's all done on the ST, and uh, you know like point of view, Star Raiders type through from the bridge view screen, shooting at Romulan ships and all this stuff. And uh, so I did that. And uh, <clears throat> and the funny thing was, Simon & Schuster's response to this thing was, we don't want to get any games that require hand-eye coordination. Huh. <laughs> wanted point and clicky manual <laughs> type stuff. Okay. So the funny thing was that, that Steve showed the animation to Broderbund, who was going to publish the animation software originally, although it eventually ended up with Epics. And Broderbund said, hey, could he do that for us to make a demo for the uh, product? So I was hired by uh, Broderbund to do this 10-minute animated cartoon um, on the ST and demonstrating the, the paint animation software. And uh, that's something else I have recreated. I haven't f- uploaded it yet because uh, the original soundtrack is lost. You know, I had, a, I had an audio recording. So mm-hmm. I have voice actor friend extraordinaire Eric Bra, who uh, does uh, video games and stuff like that. And um, he, he's acted in a bunch of stuff I've done. Uh, and uh, he's going to re-record all the narration for me to put on it. So I will re-upload this thing. Uh, you know, 30 years on from when it was done because it was done in 88. So it's been almost 30 years now. And uh, so I did this thing and I took the animations with me of the some of the sequences to, on floppy disk when I went to the analog uh, offices to the Atari show in Worcester. Worcester, I keep saying Worcester, it's Worcester. And uh, <clears throat> then so they didn't, uh, Antic had a booth and they were showing all the CAD 3D stuff and everything there. And we were right across from it. And so Clay Walden and I went to the office during the lunch break and we grabbed an ST and brought it back. And I said, hey, I've got these animations. We can run them on the monitor just so there's something going on besides magazines. So maybe that'll grab people's attention. Mm-hmm. And so that was fine. I got these little things running and I start one of them up and I walk away and I go off and do stuff. And I came back 
hour or two later, and there's a crowd of like 20, 30 people standing around watching this animation. And, you know, you'd look across the aisle and people look at the 3D stuff and they think it's really cool and they'd kind of move on. But they kept telling me at the booth, they said people just come up and they drag other people up and they'd stand there and watch this thing over and over and over. And, you know, it wasn't anything spectacular, but what I realized doing it was it's because I had animated a character. The character was a little cartoon mouse and he was fighting against the user interface. Like, you know, the uh, he like would play with the mouse pointer and hit, would let go and it would hit a button and like the alert box would shoot open and catch him in the face and knock him down. <laughs> Crap like that, you know. So he was being interacted on by the interface while demonstrating the program. And I'd say that's addictive. When you get people laughing at something you've done, you know, you just want to do more of it. And that was really the thing that cemented me about the filmmaking thing and the entertainment stuff was seeing people react like that to that, you know. And I, you know, I'm, I don't know that I'd seen any microcomputer animation before that that was really like just intentionally funny that was like not just like a little, you know, kind of a little short loop like Smurfs doing something stupid, you know, or, or whatever. Um, it was all very technical, you know, um, and even the characters were very mechanical and stuff like that. So that was really, really, you know, fascinating to uh, uh, to see that. And then um, so here, here's where this, this whole thing goes, or the weird path. So I go away later on and then later on I come back and they saw a couple guys are looking for you uh, from Omnitran Software, Tom Carbone and Bill Leslie. Mm-hmm. And they had seen the animation and they wanted to talk to me and they said, oh, we got, we're doing games. Would you be interested in doing the graphics? So I got involved with them and I did a test project for them where I did the Amiga version of the graphics for their game Breach because they'd already done the ST version. And... And then I ended up just doing all their games for the rest of the games they did. So I went from being intending to go into animation to going into video game graphics. And then, of course, you're in the video game industry and you start doing game design because you're not just working on the graphics. You're giving input. You start doing the manuals. So eventually I became a game designer and then I became a producer and then eventually, you know, you know uh, management at Namco where I ran the mobile group, you know, at the end of my uh, days there. So it was this weird tangent that all started with that stinking little Atari 800, you know, wanting to animate on that thing led me down this path where I was getting drunk with the creator of Pac-Man because I ended up in this video game company, you know, in fact, and uh, I was telling um, uh, some of the guys about this the other day, I got a little fun thing here, Um, I... uh, Meeting uh, Iwatani-san, who you know, is the creator of Pac-Man, was one of my big thrills as a video game guy. Um, and uh, he was really cool because when you know I had to prove to him I knew the games really well because I was doing all the Pac-Man ports for mobile mm-hmm. uh, when I was at Namco. And uh, <clears throat> I was the director of product development there. And we always had to send things to Japan to have them approved. And it was a real pain when we were doing tons of mobile phones. So he said... Well, not he said, but one of my my boss said we need to prove to them we know our stuff so that we can we can self approve that the builds are good. So I convinced him that I knew Pac Man really really well over a very drunken evening over su- uh, sushi and lots of sake, and he wrote me a really nice email uh, back. Uh, he didn't speak English, I didn't speak Japanese, I speak Scotchy, and uh, we had my, a coworker of mine translating for us, so he was also drunk. It was. Hilarity ensues. But uh, about a month later, he wrote me and said, you know, we don't need to send the stuff over. You you know, you know the game well enough to, you know, to, to you know, you'll do it right. So he sent me photocopies of the original specification for the game. So hmm. um, this is what this is. You can't have this, but this is a, <laughs> this is the actual uh, design that was there a year before the uh, game came out. Wow. So there's like all the things that were. Uh, Never included. Hey, there's a there's a photograph of a uh, CRT screen. Oh, nice. Yeah. Very very early maze layout with uh, little features that didn't end up in the game, which I will explain at some point. Um, but anyway, yeah. So the funny thing is, uh, you know, I started off with video games because that's how I got into technology, you know, and all that. And then of course the Atari 800 led me because I want to do film, 
right back into the game thing. So I did this big weird circle and now I'm back in the film stuff, but I'm still doing, you know, still do the computer thing somewhat and um, very involved with just the kind of the, uh, kind of the hobbyist thing, you know, with the uh, Atari age and all that stuff and always putting up questions about that kind of stuff because it still fascinates me. Um, and so anyway, so just long story short, uh, did all this stuff with analog and everything and uh, it was kind of sad when it all went down, but you could sort of see the whole Atari community disintegrating, you know. Um, and I guess the one great thing that did come out of all that was uh, I got to meet a lot of these people and get the contacts and know all the other people. So through that, I've met all these guys who are like the guys you interview, you know, uh, who like worked on all this stuff and all the games and, and uh, all that kind of thing. And, and, you know, I'll be on a message thread and, you know, Leonard Trammell will pop in and say something or, you know, uh, I, I do things like I'm writing something right now that's video game related and I'll like call up, uh, you know, uh, Howard Scott Warshaw and say, hey, Howard, how does this work? You know, <laughs> Or, uh, you know, or one of those guys and just nice. be able to, like, call them up and, you know, um, find out how the stuff worked. And, you know, the fascinating thing and the thing I think is really valuable about what you're doing, you guys are doing, uh, and I'm going to toot your horn here a little bit, is because I listen to all these things because there's this sort of history that gets lost, you know, it sort of falls between the cracks. And a lot of it's, yeah. it's the minutia of how the things happen that sometimes is super, super important. Like, um, you know, you know, Todd Fry. And sure. you guys interviewed him. Um, I've spent a lot of time talking to Todd. And since uh, I was the Pac-Man guy at Namco, we talk a lot about Pac-Man. And I pester him about Pac-Man. So, you know, um, I understand the whole reason that game came out the way it did. You know, for one thing, they didn't. he had no documentation. You know, he had, he had to basically look at the arcade machine and say, okay, how does this thing work? Um, but when you start poking around and you start getting answers from people, you start finding out how their, their thought processes work. Mm -hmm. And, like, uh, one day I had taught on Instant Messenger on uh, and Facebook, and I said, "So I, I said, so how do how do your ghosts work?" And he explained the logic, and it's completely different than the arcade logic, but it's a solution that works for the hardware that he was working on. That you you know because again, when you talk about the limitations of the hardware, you have to sort of write to the hardware. And I don't think people realize that that you know when you have tons of memory stuff, you can write all these things to get around that. Um, but when you've got like 128 bytes of memory and you have to store these states, you have to figure out this sort of really tight technical way to store things and, and, and do stuff. Um, but, but the, here, here's the funny thing that came out of that. So, uh, and I'll let, he, I'll let him tell you this at some point if you re-interview him, because I, I won't spoil it. But I said, so what would your ghost's names be? Because in the, in the Japanese version, they are, um, <clears throat> you know, everybody knows them as, Shadow, Speedy, Bashful, and Pokey in Pac-Man. Right. But in Japanese, they actually translate to Shadow, Ambusher, Fickle, and uh, pretends to be stupid. <laughs> um, because their behaviors are actually hinted at by that. The pink one is the Ambusher because he tries to get ahead of you. Mm -hmm. and so, so I asked Todd, well, based on your logic, what are their names? So he came with four names for his ghosts. And, okay. and names. So if he doesn't remember it, if you ever ask him, I will send him back the names he sent <laughs> But so Todd did come up with a set of names. So I figured if somebody ever does a hobbyist version of that again, or if Todd does a ever does a special edition of that Pac-Man, he'll have to put the screen on with the all the ghosts with their with their names. But um, but the thing that's funny is uh you know doing the film stuff and I'm like I was hired to write rewrite a feature film which is stuck in development hell right now, you know. Um, <clears throat> but I've actually been writing a, a TV pilot, and it's set in the video game industry back in the old days. So that sounds like fun. I, I spent a lot of time picking the brains of these guys and realizing that it's the questions that you ask just about the process that stuff falls out, you know, because you, somebody offers some piece of information, you know, that if you, if you just ask the straightforward questions, you don't get there. So like the, one of the things I learned and I do this now, whenever I interview anybody for anything, like uh, well, I did this with uh, Bob Smith and I say, tell me about the first day at the company and tell me about the last day at the company. Mm. So you get there. So what was my experience coming in? What was my experience going out? Mm -hmm. And like in the case of like in Magic, their last day was they had actually were so you know poor because they were going out of business that they were renting an office inside Activision. 
they were like, mm-hmm. Imagic was inside Activision at the end. <laughs> and I, that had never come out anywhere that I'd ever seen, you know. And that's the kind of stuff you get just by poking those kinds of oddball questions at people. Yeah. And, um, you know, sort of getting into, like, like, how did you end up there, you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just, it's fascinating. And just the more you sort of poke around there, like, even just funny with the development systems and everything were, and these guys have forgotten. So, like, I had a question about, um, like, lingo. Because like uh, Mike Alba, you know, do you know Mike Alba? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mike's great. Uh, yeah, for those guy. who don't know him, he was like the third engineer hired in Atari's coin op division. He's like an amazing, amazing guy, um, and is like a pack rat and owns everything. But uh, he just, you know, is the storehouse of information. So one day I asked him. I said, "Hey, did you guys use the term you know, pixel? When did that come out?" And I got this email to with Dennis Coble and all these guys arguing over when this term came out and people saying, no, we didn't use that. We called them this and then we called them that. No, no, we were using it by this. And so you realize that it's sort of murky that people don't even necessarily remember. Or somebody said, I said, when did they call them sprites? And Bob would say, oh, well, they were motion objects in the arcade group, the MOs, you know, um, and they were player missiles over in the you know, consumer side. Uh, and then somebody said, oh, the Sprite came out because it was a Sprite feature on a Texas Instruments chip. And they think that's where that term came from. So there's just all this stuff that's sort of just lost, you know, that kind of like lingo. And I go read Wikipedia pages and stuff, and, and I know it's wrong mm-hmm. because somebody's found one source and they haven't ever bothered to like really drill into it. If you talk to five of these guys, you get five different stories. And then you have to sort of sift out and try to figure out where the reality is, you know. Like, uh, and one of the things that was great about doing all this research is like, I figured out what all the development systems were at all these companies. Like, you know, everybody had a different one, you know, uh, you know, uh, Imagic had a Contron system and uh, Atari had their, you know, originally a, a P, a PDP, you know, with their, their terminals. And then they went to a VAX and, and all these things that are just, and this is, I guess this is the funny last thing about the the 8-bit experience in those days, I think I'll say, is that I think now we're so used to everything being super powerful that, of course, and, and you know this from talking to these guys, so much of what they did wasn't on the hardware. You know, like you didn't necessarily write a game on an Atari 800 computer for a 5200 game system. Mm-hmm. Write that on, you know, on a, a big old, you know, micro or a, a mainframe, a mini mainframe or something and how all these tools and, and debugging things and everything and the environments are really different. And it's just, uh, it's such a different, it's just such a different world. And it sort of gets back to that whole being close to the hardware thing, you know, that I, that I really like about those guys and you talk to them and they, you just sort of feel that they, they've got the silicon sort of etched into their, you know, into their skin almost, you know? So anyway, ramble, ramble, ramble. <laughs> If you could send a message to the Atari computer users that still exist, and you can right now, what would you tell oh, them? Oh, I'll, I'll give you one. Uh, just because it's old doesn't mean it's outlived its usefulness or isn't fun. I just pray that still applies to me as much as it does to my <laughs> anti-equipped hardware. <laughs> so remember, uh, the, uh, Orson Welles once said, the a- absence of limitations is the enemy of art. Mm. And uh, so starting on Atari's taught me the value of working inside limitations and thanks, Atari 8-Bits, for that. Awesome. Thank you, Maurice. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so two follow-up things. Uh, has that Pac-Man spec been scanned? Are you allowed to share it? <laughs> I, I'm going to – what I'm going to do, it's uh, – I'm going to actually donate a copy of it to the uh, National Video Game Museum. That's great, but then we'll never see it because it will be in their archives. Uh, you know what? Uh, it, it'll probably come out. It's. Uh, I'm actually going to probably do. I'm talking to about doing a talk next year uh, at the Portland Retro Gaming Expo, mm. where I will basically go through what that document says. Nice. Um, and I will do because we actually we took some of the features that were in that document and put them in the Pac-Man game. The last Pac-Man game I worked on at Namco in 2013, uh, which was Pac-Man Plus Tournaments, which is just Pac-Man now. I think on. It had uh, it has downloadable mazes and stuff, mm-hmm. but we implemented a number of the features that were in there and oh, put them into the thing. So they're they're in the tool set now. So if you actually played some of the tournaments, some of the features that were in that document are in that version of the game. Cool. It's not that secret anymore, but uh, <laughs> right. 
eventually I'll spill the beans, but I'd like to do it on a, a talk and show people some fun stuff. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, there's stuff out now like the, what's it called? The Pac-Man dossier where they really get into how it works. Yeah, so. There's still a secret of how it works. And to me, what's fascinating is the development of, you know, how it, it changed. Like, you know, the story about missile command and how it had like a train that would deliver the missiles and things like that early on. I've heard some stuff about missile command. And it was like, like that. originally it was, it was too, violent and it was just like this is too real and they had to dial it back because and then of course you just have a feature that's cool because they, it's realistic that things would be delivered but it's yeah. actually the gameplay killer yeah so some of the things that you see like when i look at this spec they were things that were interesting but they complicated the game too much mm-hmm. especially for a beginner you know um and uh so that's something i think is also really fascinating about and, and if everybody hasn't been to like one of these big retro gaming shows you should go uh, so I haven't been to a lot of them, but I've been to the Portland one, which is really great because tons of the uh, original guys show up there and you can ask them all kinds of questions about how this stuff works. And uh, just don't ask uh, about E.T. and Pac-Man with Todd and uh, Howard anymore there, you know. <laughs> I'd be so sick of those questions. <laughs> well, you know, don't, don't, don't ask the obvious questions. That's one of the other interview tips I learned to say. Ask the unobvious question, you know. Um, it's like uh, I, met, once met, I once met James Cameron. Mm-hmm. Uh, at a Seagraph show back in 93. Yeah. And I, I actually got his card. I stupidly never called him because I walked up to him and I said, hey, I really like that keynote address that you had published in Cinefax Magazine. And we had a whole conversation because I didn't go up to him and say, ooh, Terminator 2 or mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah. You know? So that's how you make an impression is don't, t- don't come up with the obvious shit. <laughs> Thank you so much. Absolutely a pleasure. Sorry it took us so long to get together. I'm glad we got made it work finally. So. All righty. <laughs> All right. Well, have a great day, and I'll talk to you later.